Thanksgiving. And so, since uh, the church will use just about any excuse to take an offering, uh, this week, or actually next week, uh, next Sunday, we'll be receiving our Thanksgiving offering. That will go to World Evangelism that funds all the things that you just saw in that video. So, uh, there are some special envelopes in the back, and uh, there'll be some more here next Sunday. Uh, so, if you'd like to participate in that, and I hope you will, um, you can get one of those and, and bring it with you next time. Um, we had a wonderful lunch and learn yesterday. We had 20 folks in the church, and uh, it was a great afternoon. We are fully booked for our Thanksgiving dinner this Thursday. Um, and so if you haven't booked, I'm sorry. Um, we are fully booked. Um, and as you can see, it is kind of a small space. So. Uh, we have 35 booked online, and then we have uh, another 10 or so that uh, have booked in addition to that. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, most of the people that have booked in are people that don't attend our church, which is awesome. So praise God for that. We're excited. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. All right. Let's worship this morning. Oh, I'm so sorry. Steve has another video for y'all to watch. <laughs> And I wanted to share this with you. December 5th at 7.30 here at the church. 
So if you haven't uh, booked your tickets, they're free and we'll be taking a donation for them. Um, be sure to do that on Eventbrite and uh, we're looking forward for, to, uh, to a good time of uh, yes. uh, Christmas carols and uh, that's what they sound like, so you don't want to miss them. So it'll be good. Yes. Is there something that needs up if you don't know how to book on Eventbrite, just talk to me or, or Pastor Tasha, and we'll make sure that you're, we'll make sure you're you have a reserved seat. <laughs> That's December fifth. It's a Monday. It's a Monday, so not uh, not not this coming. So it's, I think it's three Mondays or what? Yeah, three. I believe it is. We got a lot going on. Got a lot going on, y'all.
worship of good God. Absolutely. Let's continue to worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, you're right.
I'm not old. Well, I can't just call you ma'am. You could say Dennis. I didn't know you were called Dennis. Well, you didn't bother to find out, did you? I did say sorry about the old woman, but from behind you looked... Well, I object to it. You automatically treat me like an inferior. Well, I am king. Oh, king, eh? Very nice. Now, do you get that, eh? By exploiting the workers. By hanging on to outdated imperialist dogma, which perpetuates the economic and social differences in our society. If there's ever going to be any progress... Dennis, there's the... some lovely filth down here. Oh, 
How do you do? How do you do, good lady? I am Arthur, King of the Britons. Whose castle is that? King of the who? The Britons. Who are the Britons? Well, we all are. We are all Britons. And I am your king. I didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. A self-perpetuating autocracy in which the working classes... Oh, there get... you go, bringing class into it again. Well, that's what it's all about. If only people would... Please, realize... please, good people. I am in haste. Who lives in that castle? No one lives there. Then who is your lord? We don't have a lord. What? I told you, we're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. By a civil majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case of more Be quiet. I order you to be quiet. Order? Who does he think he is? I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. Well, how do you become king, then? The lady of the lake. Her arm clad in the purest shimmering samite held aloft Excalibur from the bosom of the water, signifying by divine providence that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur. That is why I'm your king. Listen, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Be quiet! Oh, but you can't expect a wheel. Now, I don't know for sure, but I'll just bet that you didn't expect to see a clip from Monty Python and the Holy Grail at church this morning. I could be wrong, I suppose, but when I was a teenager, I thought that movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, was just about the funniest thing I had ever seen in my whole life, and my friends did too. Of course, it goes without saying that my friends and I were not the coolest kids on the block. We were geeks, I guess you'd say, nerds, sort of. Uh, but that's still one of my favorite scenes in that movie. When Dennis, the radical Marxist peasant, explains the intricacies of their anarcho-syndicalist commune to King Arthur, who loses his patience and orders him to be quiet, and then Dennis' comrade, <clears throat> comrade asks, uh, who does he think he is? And Arthur explains that he's king, to which she responds, well, I didn't vote for you. <laughs> and as Arthur points out, you don't vote <coughs> for king. And he's right, of course. You know, it's only been a short while ago that King Charles became king following the death of our much-loved Queen Elizabeth. But sure enough, Arthur's right, we didn't vote for him, because that's not how monarchy works. <laughs> Of course, we didn't vote for our last three prime ministers either, but uh, that, is a somewhat, that is a somewhat unusual situation, the absence of a general election. But of course, you probably heard that we had a pretty significant election over in the United States, the midterm elections uh, a couple weeks ago, and millions of Americans voted in their states for governors and members of the House of Representatives and senators and other positions. And I suppose that um, all the votes have been counted now and the dust has kind of cleared, but there's still at least one runoff for Senate that'll take place in Georgia between uh, Herschel Walker, he played football for the University of Georgia and uh, the Bulldogs, and then he played in the NFL. Between Walker and his opponent, Reverend Raphael Warnock, he's a senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And you may have heard of that church because one of its previous pastors was a man named Dr. Martin Luther King. So it's a race between an ordained minister and a football player. And you might think that it would be obvious which one of those candidates most evangelical Christians in America would support, but it isn't because politics in America is not that simple. And they have to have a runoff because neither one of them got more than 50% of the vote. And those results were pretty typical in races all across the country because of the political polarization in the U.S. The one thing that you can say 
about a great many of the races that took place in the midterm elections all across the board is that a little less than half of the people who voted did not vote for the person who got elected. That's a lot of people who did not get the result that they wanted or that they hoped for. And I'll tell you what else happened. Regardless of what people think about one result or another, one thing that is clear is that in general, the results of the election overall were quite different from what all the political analysts were pretty sure they were going to be. What all the pundits and predictors and prognosticators said was going to happen didn't happen. The unexpected happened. Folks didn't get what they were expecting. And that happens sometimes. Because no matter how well informed and how carefully thought out our predictions and expectations might be, the truth is that we don't know what the future holds. But we can know who holds the future. That's worth saying again. We don't know what the future holds. But we can know who holds the future. Now, you may not be aware of it, but today is the last Sunday of the year. Not the last Sunday of the secular calendar year, but it is the last Sunday of the liturgical year, the church calendar. The church year begins with Advent, which, can you believe it, starts next Sunday, November 27th. It's hard to believe, I know. But next Sunday, we'll light the first Advent candle, and then at Second Helping, we'll... Um, we we'll have the hanging of the greens, and we'll begin the season when we look toward the arrival of Jesus, the promised Messiah. And then we'll move into Christmas, which only starts on December 25th, by the way. And, and so don't let anybody tell you that Christmas is over until Epiphany, which is on January 6th. Then after a little while, there's Lent and Pentecost, or Easter and Pentecost Sunday. But, but this Sunday, the last Sunday of the church year, this Sunday is known as Christ the King Sunday, or the Feast of the Reign of Christ. And it's been called that for about a hundred years, since, since about 1925, well, quite exactly 1925, when it began in response to the fact that churches faced increasing secularism, as well as the dangers of becoming instruments of totalitarian and authoritarian Regimes, because religion can be a powerful tool that can be and is used by the state, by nations and empires and political parties to accomplish their ends. And religious institutions can be used to justify actions and attitudes and institutions that are in clear contradiction to the gospel. Things like slavery, racism, the oppression of women and other marginalized groups. And how many wars have been fought in which both sides believed that God was on their side? I remember what Abraham Lincoln said about, uh, about that during the American Civil War. He was asked whether he thought God was on his side. And he said, uh, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is for us to be on God's side. But Christ the King Sunday is a reminder of the reign of Christ and a reminder to the church that its allegiance is ultimately to Christ the King and not to any worldly institution, empire, or leader, or party. And the text we're going to look at for a little while this morning comes from the end of the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. Now you may remember that last week we looked at the Gospel of John chapter 11 in the context of Remembrance Sunday, but today we're going to move ahead seven chapters to chapter 18. And in chapter 18 of John's Gospel we find a pretty dark picture of the way that political and religious groups can interact. The way that the church and the state can team up and form mutually beneficial alliances that protect and increase their power and authority and control over things. And we also see the damage that they can do. 
Now in these verses we find the familiar scene just before the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus has been arrested and taken into custody. He's been incarcerated. And he's about to be handed over to Pilate. Now, now Pilate, you'll you'll sometimes hear him called Pontius Pilate. When I was a kid, I used to think uh, I used to think that he, he was called Pompous Pilate because he was so full of himself, so so proud. He's not Pompous Pilate. He's Pontius Pilate, and he is the prefect of the province of Judea for the Roman Empire. He's kind of like the governor of Judea, and Jesus is being handed over to Pilate by the religious elite of Judea who were also in control of the local legal system. They weren't just a group of preachers and church authorities. They had officers who could bring charges and enforce the local law. So these religious authorities are about to turn Jesus over to Pilate, who can, because he has the authority to, who can sentence Jesus to death by crucifixion. And that's what these religious leaders have decided already is what they want. Execution. They want Jesus out of the picture. They want him dead and buried. And when Pilate meets with them, he asks what charges they're bringing against Jesus. And the Judean leaders use some remarkable logic here in these verses. An unassailable rhetorical device. They offer an argument that is difficult to refute. They say, look, if this man was not a criminal, we would not have turned him over to you. Do you hear what they're doing? They're saying he's a criminal because we say he's a criminal. Because our authority supersedes the truth or the facts of any case. Because our authority says he's a criminal. Because we have handed him over. And we handed him over because he's a criminal. That circular logic is hard to get out of. It's an inescapable loop. But why? Are these members of the Judean religious and legal elite so interested in seeing Jesus eliminated, crucified, executed? I'll tell you why. Because he did not meet their expectations of what the long-awaited king, the Messiah, should be. He should have been a military leader who would restore their nation to its proper place, who would throw off the yoke of Roman rule. He should have been a king who would make Judea great again, who would restore its greatness and glory. We hear that kind of rhetoric even today. We heard it just this past week in an announcement a Florida man made. But their expectations had not been met. They had been disappointed with what they got. If this Jesus was the Messiah, then they had some issues with the situation. Because this was not the king they would have asked for. This was not the king they had hoped for. This was not the king they would have voted for. Instead, here was a peasant who told us to love our enemies, who hung out with all the wrong sorts of people, the unclean of all kinds, and who dared to proclaim that they were made clean, that their sins were forgiven who challenged the power structures down to their foundation, who called the religious leaders of the day hypocrites, who used the law not to honor God, but to strengthen their positions of power and authority and to oppress others. Jesus said they kept folks out of heaven rather than bring them in. And so if this Messiah wasn't going to free them from the Roman Empire, then the local religious leaders in Judea decide that they'll at least keep enjoying and exercising the power and positions and authority that the empire gave to them. And that's what's happening here. A preservation of the way things are. The status quo by attempting to eradicate what threatens it, namely Jesus. Now let's look at the text. Beginning with verse 33, we read, Verse 33, it's there in your sermon notes. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about it? So already we see that Jesus knows what's going on. That Pilate and the local Judean authorities are in cahoots. Jesus doesn't answer Pilate's question, but questions his motives. Verse 35, Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? 
Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were, were from this world, my father would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So now Jesus answered Pilate's question, Are you the king? And of course, if he is, then he's in opposition to the Roman Empire, whose king is Caesar. But he doesn't quite say this. Because he's not claiming kingship of that place, that locality. In fact, he says specifically, my kingdom is not from here, not from this world. You know, in Jesus' culture at the time, kingship wasn't necessarily about a territory, a place, some land. A kingdom was about a people, followers. So, Jesus isn't here talking simply about a place like heaven, a place in the past, or even in the present. He's looking toward the future, toward followers who were yet to come, who were citizens of a coming kingdom. Let's continue with verse 37. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. I'm trying to get some clarity here. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king? For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And let's look at that last verse here. Verse 38. Pilate asked him, What is truth? There's the question, and that's the question, isn't it? If you can cast some doubt, not just on whether something is true or not, but if you can cast doubt on the very meaning of truth itself, then you can get away with all sorts of things. You can do some damage. And this question, what is truth, doesn't just originate with the idea of fake news and relativism and postmodernism. It's been around since before Twitter and before Facebook and before social media. It's been around since even before newspapers, since before the printing press. It's been around since the Garden of Eden. It's an old question, an ancient question. It might even be the original question, the essential question upon which every answer relies. What is truth? Now, it would seem that for both Pilate and for the Judean religious leaders, truth is whatever is politically beneficial. Whatever works to preserve the status quo. And isn't it still the case that the truth can be twisted, the truth can be bent and broken to fit our purposes? But I would suggest this morning that for the Christian church, truth isn't so much a what as it is a who. And that who is the one to whom we belong, the king whose followers we are, the king that's been incarcerated by these religious leaders who want him out of the picture. But Pilate doesn't stick around long enough to get an answer to this question, what is truth? Now, we probably all know what happens next. Skipping a few details, Pilate tells the Judean religious leaders that he can't find a reason to charge Jesus, to, to which they respond by reminding him that if he releases Jesus, who claims to be a king, Caesar, Pilate's boss, might see that as an act of disloyalty. Pilate's supposed to uphold Caesar's authority and enforce his rules, so letting Jesus proclaim that he's a king would be a betrayal of his allegiance to the empire. So Pilate tries to compromise by having Jesus flogged, tortured. And the Romans knew how to inflict some injury. So after Jesus is flogged, Caesar tries and fails to convince the Judean leaders that Jesus should be released. And then Pilate Asked the Judeans in chapter 19, verse 15. He says, uh, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answer, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over to be crucified, and there it is. We have no king but the emperor. The allegiance of these religious leaders who questioned Pilate's loyalty 
is made perfectly clear here. We have no king but Caesar. And that's why we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. To remind ourselves of the great danger that can arise from the marriage of religious and political institutions. And when Christians in particular forget that their allegiance is ultimately to a kingdom and a king who is not of this world. To remind us of the great injustices that may arise when we succumb to the temptation to slip into the complacent comfort of the status quo. When the church is offered positions of power and authority by the powers that be, as long as we support their plans and purposes and they ours, like the Judean leaders and Pilate, Christ the King Sunday reminds us that when those authorities and power structures ask the church to directly support or to acquiesce in the face of injustice and inequality and unrighteousness to silence our prophetic voice, to enlist Jesus in the service of the state, the church must unequivocally point to the one who sits in judgment over all the world and proclaims freedom to the oppressed. Christ the arrested, incarcerated, crucified, and resurrected King. You know, almost 60 years ago, 1963, another king had been arrested and incarcerated, and he sat in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. And as he sat incarcerated in that cell, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote a letter to some church leaders who basically thought that he needed to calm down. They said his activities, his marches, and his protests for civil rights were unwise and untimely. And in that letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote these words. This is what he wrote. There was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Wherever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contest. Things are different now. Things are different now. The contemporary church is so often a weak ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it'll lose its authentic reign. It will forfeit the loyalty of millions and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet people, young people every day whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. And now, 60 years later, Christ the King Sunday challenges us to make clear where our loyalties lie as the church of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, to heed the call of the coming kingdom of which we are citizens. The church must say, 
to those on the left side of the political spectrum. We will talk about Jesus. We will talk about sin and repentance and forgiveness and holiness and the wrath of God. And we will proclaim the crucifixion and resurrection. And we will not apologize for it nor be intimidated by the fear of being thought intolerant. We will live out the holiness that God demands of us. But also to the political right. We must say, we will embody the radical love that the body of Christ is called to. We will issue a prophetic call to social justice. We will defend the sanctity of creation. We will protect life in all its forms. We will not be used as a prop for systems that promote inequality and injustice and destruction and fear. We will neither condone authoritarianism nor ignore oppression. We will not sanctify warfare as a part of a political strategy nor as anything other than a last resort. We will feed the hungry. We will offer hospitality to every member of our community whether they look like us or believe like us or love like us or talk like us or vote like us or not because Jesus taught us to love everybody to take care of others just as fully as we take care of ourselves. To the powers that be on all sides. The church must proclaim that we will not be domesticated by secularism, by liberalism, by fascism, by conservatism, nor any other ism. We will proclaim the good news of the gospel. We'll feed the hungry. We'll heal the sick. We'll love both our neighbors and our enemies alike. We'll clothe the naked and rescue the perishing and visit the imprisoned. We'll love the Lord with all our hearts and souls and hearts and minds. We'll make disciples in all the nations because that is what is required of all who are citizens of that coming kingdom of heaven. That is what is required of all who follow Christ the King. But following Jesus, following King Jesus is not just about what is required of us. It is about what is offered to us. Not just about obligation, but about opportunity. Not simply about what we have to do, but what we get to do. And what we get to do when we follow Jesus brings joy and peace that passes understanding. It is an undeniable privilege and a blessing that each one of us is given the opportunity to follow Christ the King. I want to ask our worship team to come on up. Wouldn't be Christ the King Sunday without singing the sort of definitive hymn. And that's what's coming up. And uh, I have a confession to make. This hymn we're about to sing, I sung uh, this hymn in churches for years and years, decades, without knowing really what it meant. There's a lyric, uh, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I sang this song for years and years. And I didn't know what a diadem was until I finally said, I can figure that out. I didn't know to look that up. And so I looked it up and found out that it's, it's a crown. And suddenly that uh, that lyric made a lot, a lot, of, a lot more sense. So, and that may or may not have happened just this morning. But uh, <laughs> if you don't know what that word means, now you know it.
Though the days increase in their darkness, the Lord of light and love reigns supreme. May the power of God's love be in your hearts and reflected in your lives now and always. Go in peace and may God's peace be with you. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.